Today's episode of The Anthony Anderson Show is brought to you by MountGox.com, that's M-T-G-O-X.com, and MezzyGrill.com, M-E-Z-E Grill.com, and CarpeVM.com, that's C-A-R-P-E-V-M.com. Greetings, everyone. Uh, Anthony Anderson coming at you live from New York City. Uh, here with an honored guest today, my good friend Kurt Cummins of Keystone Herbs. Hey, Kurt, how's it going, buddy? Good. How you doing, Anthony? Very good to have you on the show, my brother. Thanks for having me. Um, so you're definitely a wild mushroom hunter, wild food forager, spring water enthusiast, but let's get into how you got onto this path. For those that don't know you, uh, for those out there, give us a little intro about what's going on. Um, well, I guess I kind of got on the, the natural health path when I was, I was living in Europe. Uh, I was lo- fortunate enough to go to school over there for a semester and you know I was traveling and I was having a good time and I was doing everything that I wanted to be doing I was just loving life and then I got I got kinda sick okay and oh you can't enjoy anything when you're sick right so I was thinking I'm doing everything I want to be doing but I I don't feel up to doing anything at all yeah so I kinda started to look into it and I I kinda started to look around and, and kind of get an outside perspective of what's going on in the U.S. Okay, yes. Because you re- when you're in it, you don't see it. When you're outside of it, things start to, think, things change. Uh-huh. And you, you really do see things from a different perspective. So I, I started seeing all the sickness and, man, I don't want to be a victim of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I started looking into the raw foods. Okay. Started up the smoothies, started up the juicing, I got the the Jack Lane, you know, and I, the Black and Decker, and I still have both of them. Like I don't even have a Vitamix yet, but I've <laughs> I've been in this lifestyle for like four or five years. Okay, four or five years. So, um, it, uh, I don't know. It, it it just sends you on a journey. Once you start, you really can't stop. You know, you're always you're always looking to get better and better and better. Yeah. Which country were you in when everything uh, started up? I was in the Netherlands. Okay. Okay. And um, did you find that it was pretty easy to get into the natural food? Like, do they have farmers markets over there? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Holland's not a great, great country for produce. Everything's shipped in, uh-huh. like everything. Almost. Um, but they did have a lot of farmers markets. I mean, I guess everything's shipped in, anyways. But they did have farmers markets. Um, there's the Albert Cup market, which is one of the most popular stretches in Europe, as far as you know. Um, markets, you know, fresh fish, fresh vegetables. Mm-hmm. But um, it was interesting that when I was there too, like you would be at the university cafeteria and you wouldn't see people getting like mac and cheese and like all this other junk. They were they had a roll and soup. You know, they had a bread roll and soup, or they had something simple. They weren't eating Doritos. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And people were trim over there. You know, like sure. People just looked trim and fit. I mean, they had—they do have their obesity issues. Like it's—it's it's definitely rising, and they have the most amazing French fries with mayonnaise. That's the <laughs> thing. It's, right. it's incredible. But yeah, so that just propelled into looking into lo- raw and living foods. I was vegetarian for a year. Okay. Um. Got off that for no particular reason. I just started. I just started eating meat again. Mm-hmm. Um. Mm-hmm. But. Um, I try not to get too crazy with my food choices. Sure, sure. Growing up, so you're you're from Pennsylvania, right? Yes, Growing northwestern up. Pennsylvania, right, right, northern Appalachia. Okay, northern Appalachia. I live right outside of the Allegheny National Forest. Wonderful, very so nice. It's a it's a it's an incredible it's an incredible area. Yeah. Really and was it um, growing up? Was it pretty standard diet? Or were your parents oh, yeah. into this? Okay. Standard American diet, no doubt. Yeah. All the way. It's funny because my mom is the first one to she kind of she kind of started doing this stuff like getting like organic milk and stuff like that back in the day. Or at least or at least not getting vitamin D. That's, I'm not I'm sorry. D milk. Oh sure, sure. You no, know, like like the like the real deal, like it, it has all the fat in it, all of everything. It's it's and then you have two percent, and then you have skim. Well, she started with like going down to two percent, and then doing skim, and then 
later on she found organic. You know, so it, it takes those little baby steps. Some people think they got to make the huge jump, but you know, just taking those little baby steps good matter. Point. Yeah, really good point. So, and then it, um, I just kept rolling with the lifestyle and, and then started uh, looking into herbalism. And mm -hmm. that's when things got really cool and really interesting. Especially when you find out you can find these herbs in your own environment for yes. free. Yes, yes. So... Coming from coming from like the the standard living, you know, just living middle you know middle America, all that was it kind of a stretch? Like, do your friends back home and your family do they think it's strange that you've become like a mushroom hunter and a wild food forager? Is this, are you kind of like the black sheep in the family? Um, yes and no. Um, people are curious. Okay, cool. They, they don't ask. They don't ask a lot about it, but they don't. They certainly don't put me down for it either. Oh, great. You know, but um, it does strike people strange when they hear s mushrooms. Like, what the heck are you doing with these mushrooms, man? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it's, it's really weird because um, everyone gets nervous when you hear mushroom. Yes. I don't know why. People get scared. <laughs> yeah, it's really a strange notion to think why that is. But um, I... I I don't always bring it up in conversation that I hunt mushrooms, but it, it's it's been a big part of my life for the past like two or three years. And you know? where did the like in particular like hunting the mushrooms? Was there a certain person or some books that inspired you on that path? Yeah, a guy by the name Daniel Vitalis. Daniel Vitalis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's pretty cool. I, I I got into watching him like I think three years ago. Ever since the beginning, ever since he started putting videos out. Mm -hmm. um, watching his talks on water and it's funny throughout this whole raw food journey and like this natural mystic lifestyle I've really held on to spring water the most and mushrooms the most yeah you know yeah I mean of course the raw foods I mean I, I, I usually have at least a smoothie a day or, or some juice sure you know, just aware of I'm more aware of what I'm what I'm putting into me of course but the, the spring water and the, the wild mushrooms have been huge. Yeah. And, and, not, not just, not, and not just using them, going out to find them and seeking them out. I mean, once you, once you get out in the woods and you, you know how to start using your environment out there, it changes everything. And, it, and it's, it's a really cool experience because you're not you're, – and it's cool just to go out and lollygag in the woods and just have no particular reason for being there. That's fine too. But to have – to have a mission in mind when you're out in the woods like that and yeah. to keep an eye out for something, it's yeah. pretty neat. It's a neat feeling. Very cool. Very cool. Um, as far as the spring water goes, what, um, where did you, I mean, I know it was Daniel Vitalis, so findaspring.com is what you use to? Yeah, well, um, I do use find, well, I haven't really forged water anywhere else than Pennsylvania and New York. Okay. You know, okay. When I travel, I'm not I'm not gone for that long, and um, I haven't really needed to use it yet. But it's an awesome tool. My um, I always recommend it to my friends. Either way, mm -hmm. they've they've really grown, haven't they? They've Huge. got tons of springs on yeah. there. I remember when they, when it started maybe three years ago, and you know the blue the blue stick pins are like all over the map now. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but isn't it great though? You you forage your own spring water, and it's like. It's an it's another event for you to do for the day. That's it's, it's kind of like an adventure. Yeah, I'm, pretty, yes. I'm big on adventuring more than anything. It's, I think it's really important. Like when you're out in those woods, you know, you're just like, Ugh. you know, you're you're just that that is the rewilding. That's you know, that's the, that's the rewilding that Daniel Vitalis is talking about that needs to happen. That I appreciate because I've noticed it myself. Like you kind of you kind of get more aggressive the more time you spend out in the woods. Not in a bad way, but like a, you get a little bit more, you get a little bit more juice pumping through your veins. You know what I mean? I see what you, you mean. Because you spend a lot of time in your food forest and you, I'm sure you walk around the woods. Yeah. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. You know, there, it's, I think like the energy from the, from the space starts to come in your body and, and you is. just feel and really like, good. Things start to happen. Like, like you have primal, you, you have some, some primal fears get spiked here and there because you're, you're out in the woods by yourself well, I, when I, I usually am and you know you might hear something over 
in the distance, and you don't know if it's a bear or not. You don't. You really don't know what's going on over there. It could be anything. You get a little nervous in your stomach, and you know you might look for a stick, or you might take cover and hide. You know, like these little things come up, and you have emotions that you otherwise might not have had throughout the day. You know, it's 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 a really neat experience. Yeah. So. And it, it, we're we're in we're in mid August right now. What is the what's the season for mushrooms? I mean, I know different mushrooms have different seasons. So, what have you been looking for lately? Well, lately I've been looking for reishi, and reishi is actually it seems to be like a second wave is coming of them because lately I've been out and I've been finding a lot of rotted ones. It's so sad to see because you see oh. these beautiful mushrooms, but they're just like. The underside's all black, and all the little critters have gotten to it. And uh -huh. The bugs love these mushrooms, man. But um, yeah, reishi. It seems like it's having its second wave of uh, of blooming's. And I actually found I was out before this interview today, and I got a big wow like, big one here. And that's like that's in prime condition, you'd say. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is exceptional. This is <laughs> usually. Usually you're gonna find something like this, but a little bit bigger. Okay, sure, sure, sure. That looks like a moose horn, man. Yeah, isn't that great? Moose antlers. Wow. But yeah, man, it's it's the reishi mushroom. It's every time you find it, you're, you're never you're not, you're never just like oh there's a reishi. You're just like oh man. Yeah. Check this out. You yeah. know, you're so excited every time, and it, it never gets old, and especially. Especially when you find some chaga. Okay, that's chaga. Oh man, yeah, this is this is a pretty substantial. That's probably the biggest chaga I've ever seen. Yeah. And where are there certain trees that that produce certain mushrooms? Well, for folks that don't know what these mushrooms are, these are these are just medicinal mushrooms. They are of they're a type of mushroom called the polypore. Polypore. They're the polypore mushroom or the tree mushrooms. They grow out of trees and they're non toxic. Some you know, some people might be slightly allergic. I guess that's the only that's the only thing to look out for, but otherwise they're they're completely non toxic and they can't hurt you. All right. Mm -hmm. So this is a Larishi. This has been revered in Chinese history for thousands and thousands of years. They've They've create, they've they've pretty much ingrained it into a lot of their artwork. Uh huh. If you can see. Oh yes. Let's see here. He's got Rishi at the end of his staff. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I don't know if you can see. But uh, here's a sage right here. He's got Rishi at his staff also. Yeah. I don't know, it's just, there's a lot of folklore around it, and it can be romantic and kind of airy-fairy, but I, I like it. It's neat, you know, it's, it's, it's a cool thing to, it's cool to be able to seek out something like this in the forest and to be able to drink it and really benefit from it in a lot of ways. This is called the mushroom of, the herb of spiritual potency and medical wonder. Hmm. I mean, so, I mean, there's real science behind this. I mean, oh, this is definitely. A, there's a ton of science behind it. I mean, I'm really big on Paul Stamets. Paul he's, Stamets. Okay. He's the leading. He's the leading man right now in mycology and the study of mushrooms. Um, what it can do for health benefits and mm -hmm. benefits of the ecosystems. It's just, I mean, mushroom mycelium eating oil. Yeah. And like digesting it and just yeah, it's unreal breaking it down it's, 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 we're just touching the surface with what we can do with mushrooms you know like it's still not well known by mycologists mm -hmm. but yeah. they're all about um, for, know, so. for anyone out there who's not familiar it's Paul Stamets S-T-A-M-E-N-T-S -E and that book is called Mycelium Running and it, it's it's like so much. It's expansive. It's it's probably one of the best books you could read right now. Highly recommended. <laughs> Very yeah, cool. It's incredible. I have another one by him called uh, Myco Medicinals. Okay. An informational treatise on mushrooms. 
Very cool. So in in uh, my area up here in northwestern Pennsylvania, we have an array of mushrooms. I'm just going to show you what we got going on here. We've got some chaga here. Can you see that all right? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Ch okay, that's chaga. C -A -C -A -H -A -G -A, C-A-H-A-G-A, chaga. Chaga. We got the turkey tail. Turkey tail. Now, this, this has a special compound called polysaccharide K okay. in it, and it is huge for inhibiting tumors. Oh, okay. Yes. I mean, there's been more, there's been more research done on the turkey tail mushroom than any other, than any other one. So, I mean, it's a, it's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry in Asia. Mm -hmm. So we have Fomis fomentarius right here. Iceman fungus. Yes, sir. Um, so, like, is it some 5,000 years ago, there was, there was an Iceman who was, well, in 1991, they found an Iceman who uh, had... Fomis fomentarius and uh, birch polypore. Okay. On his body, you know, he had it on his. In a satchel. Him. Yeah. And uh, they, pr I'm sorry about the camera here. Oh, it's okay. They presumed that he was using um, one of them for, um, like a fire spunk to let to let a fire. Cause okay. This. This holds a flame for miles and miles. Like if you get a, if you get a little bit going, its embers will burn for a long time, and people could uh, carry fires that way. Uh huh. So it was it was really beneficial. This was also used, um, to, like I said, to to create that spark, and it actually fueled some wars. Uh, it's there, there's a lot there's a lot around this mushroom itself. Really? Wow. But um, yeah. Fueled the wars. And what else we have here? Do you get any maitake or shiitake up there? I haven't found any of that. Yeah. I haven't found any of that at all yeah. around here. I never but, see um, it. I think it's almost like you people have to specifically grow it. They're never going to find yeah. it wild. Which, that's, I'd, I'd like to get my own going. Did you put any of those in at your yeah. place in Minnesota? Yeah, and I'm just kind of waiting. I don't know if they took or not. Um, I've seen... Oyster mushrooms pop out and turkey tail pop out. And oh yeah, that's um, I've got a lot of wild turkey tail on the property. I just when, when I'm out in the woods, I like to just peel off a little bit and chew it like gum. It's great. Oh cool. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, uh, let's see here. As, um, have... Are there different types of reishi mushroom? Oh yeah, there's different types of reishi mushroom. I'm sorry. This one here is uh, reishi suge t. T S G U A E. Okay. Um, this grow that grows in this this region, the Northeast. I think these also grow up in Maine, pretty much the whole entire Northeast. Sure. Um, there's not many lucidums in this area. Um, it's it's Gan Ganoderma is the family. Ganoderma. So okay. As long as it's Ganoderma, it's awesome because we also have Artist Conch right here. Oh, and that's cool. This is Ganoderma aplanatum, and it has more. It has it has pretty much the same constituents that reishi does, but reishi is just a little bit more special because of its, you know, there, there's supposed, you know, there's spiritual effects, and there's there's a lot more than's in these books. You know, they talk about how how reishi builds your will and your spirit and your and it's a pretty, it's a Shen builder, I believe. I think it, actually, I think it builds all three. The mm. Shen, Jing, and Qi. Is that all three? I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, man. It's With, um, so how do you, like, okay. Kurt, I got this from Kurt, actually, about two weeks ago. And this is, this is the Rishi. And then he gave me a chunk of this Chaga. So, Kurt, how do I t take this and convert it into medicine that I can put into my body. Okay. I like to do it a couple different ways. Cool. I and it depends on what I got going on. If I want to have a some some tea quickly in an hour, and if I don't have anything in the crock pot, then I'll just I will. Let me see if I can make this work here. 
you see this uh, a yeah, little bit? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. I'll, I'll cut up, you know, maybe a maybe a tablespoon worth. Okay. And it's you can see you don't need much. You can use you can use this much for just a a liter of tea. Okay. See that? Yeah. It there looks, you go. Yeah. Everything's backwards on my on my webcam, so it's tough to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you just you would just boil that in water for anywhere from a half hour to two hours. I mean, it's it's ideal to it's ideal to boil it for at least two hours. But take baby steps. You don't have to, you know, mm -hmm. rush yourself. And do you do a full on boil or is it just like a low simmer, um, like a crock pot? Well, that's not. I'm sorry about that. I should have got that in there. Oh, okay, cool. Here's a crock pot right here. I'll just I'll just toss some in a crock pot, um, and just keep. It, it's really simple, guys. There, there's there's water soluble there's water soluble constituents in the herbs, and you're just trying to pull them out. So don't get lost in the details of trying to make the perfect cup of tea or perfect anything. You just want to make sure you get it in water. It's hot and it's there for a while because it's going to continue to break down and break down. Yeah. So. My favorite way is the crock pot because it's always hot. It's always breaking down, getting stronger and stronger. You toss a couple more herbs in there, a couple more mushrooms, and you add some more water, and you're good to go. Wow, it's cool. Pretty much set it and forget it. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about coming back and having like your mushrooms caramelized on your, you know, caramelized on your uh, pot, you know, for, sure, because it boiled all the water down. Sure. So that, that's that's the best way. But I'm gonna create a couple tutorial videos to show exactly how I do it and um, we'll see how those turn out. It should be good. But um, hmm, what else do we got here? As far as wild food foraging, I, uh, I got my own pine palm this year. I still haven't used it all. Nice. Do you have a lot left? Uh, just maybe uh, half a cup. You I got think. a bunch. Yeah. You got a lot, man. It took me a long time to it, even get it yeah that much I think because you were dealing with white pines up there and yeah. I was I, I was dealing with these um, uh, I think it's called the cheer pine C-H-I-R and then there's these Afghan pines and they just put out really big pine cones pine flowers pine catkins and so I was able to really get a lot from there but um, in Minnesota it's just the white pines and they're very small yeah. so I know I know you're I feel you man it's tough you don't even want to go for it as much. It's just, <laughs> you get kind of spoiled. It takes. I mean, it was it was humbling. I mean, it just takes so long. It's a really tedious process. But well, if you can, was, if you can, head down to Southern California, like in late February, or even mid, you know, Valentine's Day towards the end of February, and you'd be amazed at. You'd just be feeling like I would say, if you're really on it, you could fill like a garbage bag full of pine pollen in really? you know maybe in a day or two. God, it, it, would, it would be uh, intense, but you'd be able to get that much. Yeah. Um, and just freeze it and yeah, yeah. I mean, we just put it in water now or we'll, we'll dump some in the smoothie with raw milk and we do like a shilajit and then raw milk and pine yeah. pot. And just drink yeah. it. It's so good. Oh, it's amazing. I, so love, uh, I love getting, I'll just take spring water in the morning sometimes. Spring water, a little bit of pine pollen and some spirulina. Nice. And a little bit of soleil salt in there. And okay. that's a that's a heck of a morning drink. Yeah, yeah it is. You just feel great. And then, and it's funny cuz the spirulina fills you up. Does it fill you up pretty good? It you does. Know, like, yeah, it's pretty dense. It's dense. You know, on a, on the spirulina side note, um I I was talking about that the other day and NASA said that it's 1000 times more nutritionally dense than leafy green vegetables. Really? I don't know, because they're trying to get like really condensed nutrition into the astronauts, so they okay. started bringing spirulina up there, and you know, it's uh, whatever, who knows, but that's what they tell us. <laughs> that's wild. So what are you drinking? I'm drinking a chaga, reishi, turkey tail, and honey tea. Wow, cool. Um, it's, it's really cool, like, these tree mushrooms, most of them are all medicinal, Mo mostly all of them are medicinal. They have something in them that's going to benefit you some way. I guess we haven't even really talked about why you want to even be dealing with these mushrooms in the first place. But um, <laughs> yes, exactly. They, they have 
nutrients in them that we just haven't been exposed to ever, pretty much. And, and they're just so concentrated with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have um, long long chain polysaccharides. Yeah, they have polysaccharides that um, educate your immune system um, and modulate it. And beta glucans and triterpenes. There's just yes. there's so many things that just uh, I have to read you a few things from this book. Sure. Just on just on like reishi alone, just what what it does for you. And now that uh, um, okay, you ready? You got it. Okay, cool. What's up? Oh, I wasn't sure if you were if you had to page through it for a little bit, but you you found it. You're there. Uh, reishi contributes to pain relief. Um, has a calming effect. It's it's awesome with uh, insomnia. Okay. Um, it inhibits platelet aggregation. I guess you know it doesn't allow blood coagulation and mm-hmm. you know blood, blood clots. Reishi alleviates bad blood or chi defi- uh, deficient blood. Hmm. It contains over 100 triterpenes. Um, it's just. Triterpenes seem to be the component responsible for blood pressure and blood lipid improvements. Wow. Triterpenes give reishi an adaptogenic quality, providing the person with protection from a wide range of biological, environmental, and social stresses. And it's no joke, too. When you, and when you take reishi, it's just things that you would have been stressed out about before, they don't bother you, and you figure them out without getting all worried. Yeah, you make better decisions. It's I don't know. I, I I would I would suggest anyone to. Well, I don't really want to suggest anyone anything to anyone, but <laughs> you're a fan. <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a fan of reishi chaga. I mean, all the mushrooms are incredible. And do you do any alcohol extractions? Yes, alcohol and water. I have. Oh. And like, would there be certain? Okay, cool. I've got a wild, uh, this one's been going for a long time, and this is just chaga soaked in brandy. In brandy? Yeah. So why brandy? Um, just a grape, it, it tastes better. Um, you know, it's really funny, like this, this community, this online community, this health community is so, is so um, very thorough with everything, you know, like, and I, I asked, I asked a well, thorough. I really meant to say anal about everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I asked an herbalist, and you know, he'll he'll make a tincture with a cheap brandy, you know, and and it seems like we go above and beyond and get like organic brandy or something that's not. Well, you don't want anything that's GMO, and that's 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 a good part about going for the the great brandy. But and I mean, what is br- wh- what is brandy derived from? Uh, just grapes. It's grape alcohol. It's mostly grapes. Yeah. Wow. So it's it. Pardon me. That see, I don't think many people know what brandy comes from. I know. Hmm. Very it's, cool. it's an it's an awesome alcohol. It's, so it's, it's a great alcohol to pull from. Yeah. So you're using more brandy instead of let's say vodka or rum or something. I actually have I have I'll tell you what. Um, Vodka is not bad either. Uh, at least like Svedka. Svedka is pretty good. It's five times distilled. Okay. And it's really, really, really clean. So I mean, I wouldn't get too hung up on the alcohol. I mean, you know, it's just get them in the alcohol and pull the good stuff out. Anything that anything um, that's bad in the alcohol, the reishi is going to overcome it. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as far as how clean the alcohol is. It but, will, um, from what I heard from Daniel Vitalis, it was sounding like once you get to that point where you're really like distilling the alcohol, and there's nothing else left. There, there are no toxins left. It's impossible because of that right. process. It's it's alcohol. <laughs> it's, it's gone. It's, it's alcohol. You know. It's, yeah. Yeah. There can't be anything in there. Okay, cool. So upcoming now we're in mid August. What kind of mushrooms are you going to be hunting for in the fall? Um. Well, some of the mushrooms that are growing right now will last until almost, almost nearly November. Okay. Uh, but, but right, like I said, like right now, turkey tails out in full bloom. We got some beautiful rains up here. Things are just flourishing hard, hardcore, and uh, the rishi's out. So after that goes away, the 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 mushrooms you can harvest in 
the winter time, the colder climates are the artist conch. Because this stuff, this stuff is exposed to the elements, you know, like this is always dealing with something harsh. So it's, it's, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's genes are tough. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'll be looking for artist conchs, red belted polypores, which are awesome. Red belted polypore. Yeah. Fascinating. They are, I've um, heard of it. Homitopsis pineacola, I believe. Very cool. And they have, you know, they have, uh, polysaccharides vary. So, uh, Paul Stamets mentions it's best to get a variety of different polysaccharides from different types of mushrooms because they'll fill in the slots where one didn't, where one didn't check something, the other one will, you know? Sure. It's one of those games. So, and I'll also be looking for chaga in the chaga. winter time, which is the best time to hunt for it because it sticks out like a sore thumb. If you're just walking along and it's, it's snowy outside and you see this coming off the side of a tree, I mean, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. It's, it's, it's a lot better way to um, find uh, chaga, do it, in those, do it in the wintertime. <sighs> Sorry. And but, um, okay, so you've started, due to your passion of the mushroom hunting, you have established a company called Keystone Herbs. Yeah, I was, I was out in the woods and I was, I was uh, just out on a hunt and I was like, well, I, I feel really spoiled to have all of these awesome mushrooms everywhere and I get to, I get to reap the benefits of them. <laughs> and I thought, well, how can I get these mushrooms to other people? The, the, as far as as far as I know, there's no other place where you can go to a website and order mushrooms that were just picked um, not too long ago. They were picked st sustainably, like because like chaga, you know, y you don't know. It's a, it's a delicate mushroom because as far as its its growth cycle, mm -hmm. ten to ten to twenty years, you know, to oh. reach full maturity and. They're rare as it is, mm -hmm. so I mean I don't think they're going away anytime soon. But I I don't think, you know, who knows if companies are taking pieces like this, pieces like this big off of trees that haven't fully developed yet, and like people taking the smaller runts and not letting them go to full size because it's the next generation. You want to nourish the next generation of chagas. Yeah. But um. So yeah, how where are there, was it? Where's there a company that um gets fresh mushrooms, picks them sustainably, and I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it just made sense to me to start this up. Right, right. Because I've heard a lot of it comes from Russia, and they might not be, they might be over harvesting. And yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't know what's going on in Siberia, you know? Mm -hmm. you, you don't know their practices, and dealing with these big companies, some don't care. You know, so, some people think, oh, we're, they're in the natural... They're in the natural health business, so they're they're ethical. It doesn't always work that way. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of a um, a naive assumption, probably. It's something to look out for, you know. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. getting mushrooms that were just picked in good ecosystems and handled well and with care and prepared for you. Yeah, and I'm I'm excited for it. It's gonna be it's gonna be enjoyable. Cool. So I don't know if you can see the, you remember that the big, the nice Rishi that you gave me, the really shiny one? Yeah. So yeah. if I wanted to make a tea from that tonight, how much would I shave off and, or, or would you recommend that I just put maybe half of it in and just continue to add water or? Yeah. If, if you're, if you're going to, you could just put half of it in and continue to add water and give yourself a, a good Rishi regimen for like a week and a half. Okay. You know, okay. like get yourself on it every day. Like if you just wanted to make, see how this one has just a chunk like that? Oh, sure. Off. That's a I serving. Just, yeah, I mean. Oh, cool. Take a couple of chunks like that. Okay. And just, and, beautiful. and break them up. And just break them down with some water, you know? I, um, I like to keep I like to keep a dial on about six, like five or six, and keep a keep a 
a cover over top so the goodies don't fly out in the steam. Oh, huh. So, and 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 sometimes like, I really don't have a set way to do it. I really don't. Sometimes I sometimes I simmer it for a long time. Sometimes we'll give it a hard boil. Right. It really just depends on what's going on. But you're not going to hurt it either way. Okay. Just okay. remember that. All you, all you, all you want to do is get it hot, get it, get it uh, soaked in water, just pull the goodies out. Wow, cool. And could I throw in some vanilla beans on top of that? Yeah, or? throw in all kinds of stuff. Throw in anything you want. I got some, sometimes I put in some turkey tail. Old, oh, old yeah. Jake from Utah sent, sent this stuff out. And sometimes I will put um, mint what? in there to make it taste nice. Like, I'm a weirdo. I don't mind the taste of it now. Like I'm acclimated to it, to the mushroom. I kind of like the the musty mushroom taste. It's pretty good to me. Yeah. But um, hmm. if you were gonna give this to somebody else and they were a little leery of it, I'd put some like mint leaves in there and like steep it for like, the last twenty minutes. Okay. You know. But um, it's it's a really fun thing to do. You know, at Keystone Herbs, I I, I really want to I want to make mushrooms cool again. And I want to make I want to help make mushrooms understood a little bit better. So it's it's going to be part mushroom education and um, providing these mushrooms to people who live in big cities and who can't otherwise get out in the forest and look on their own. No, that's great. So it's it's going to be nice. I'm, it's going to be launched uh, September first. Okay, September first. September first. So please look out for it. And if you want to go up and if you want to. Um, get on the email list and keep in touch, then go to keystoneherbs.com and just sign up on the mailing list. It's not, it's not, the, the website's not finished right now by any means, but it's, it's on its way. Cool. Very cool. Well, let's take a little break for our sponsors. All right. And um, we're going to start off with Mt. Gox. It's an online exchange service for Bitcoins. They now accept British pounds, Australian dollars, and they're also accepting Canadian dollars. It's a continuing fee of 0.3% now, um, now, yep, it's all good. And um, check out Mt. Gox, Mt. Gox for sure. They're based out of Japan, really reputable company. And Mezzi Grill. Mezzi Grill is an authentic Mediterranean restaurant. It's, um, it's fast, but it's quality. They're now serving breakfast as well. Check out their menu online and also check them out on menupages.com. They're on 8th Avenue in New York City and they're actually the first restaurant in the world to accept Bitcoin. And they also made the, the newest edition of New York City Clean Plates, which is really important. And Carpe VM. Carpe VM, it's a online marketing company that develops videos for your website, for your business. So if you have any concepts or ideas, they will definitely formulate a video to help you promote your, your website, promote your business. They work very closely with you from the beginning to the end to make sure that your video will really make a strong impact. I mean, video on the web is a really ideal way to engage your viewers, so definitely check them out. It's carpevm.com. Cool, buddy, cool, man. So okay, on top of the on top of the the mushrooms, you're also a fan and and a very strong enthusiast, a biodynamic gardener. Um, I know your uncle Bob had gotten you into that, and I've had your biodynamic honey. Tell us a little bit about the biodynamics it's, and how you got into that. Well, I, I haven't. I, I'm interested in it and I advocate for it, but I've been I've been having to have my own full out biodynamic garden myself. Oh sure. I've helped my, you know I've I've I've. Um, just been influenced by my uncle's garden. I grew up next door to it, and he's had it for 11 years. Well, 11 or more. What's the, 13, what, what, makes a, what makes a garden or a farm biodynamic? What is biodynamics? Well, biodynamics is, wow, it, it, it's, it, it's a wild subject. Um, who, essentially, who essentially it, it's... It's a closed loop system where everything lives in harmony with each other um, as far as the cycle of life. So you, you, you have a soil amendment, soil amendments, mm -hmm. you treat the soil, um, you, really spoil, you really give a lot of attention to the soil. Um, there, there's preparations which are made in really strange ways. Um, I'm talking like 
a liver sewn inside of a, stu a, a cow's stomach and buried in, it sounds really wacky, there's really strange procedures, but it's amazing and its results are incredible. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, was, it, was, it was conceived by Rudolf Steiner in the early 1920s. Okay. Some, some, some farmers came up to him, a lot of farmers came up to him and, and said, Hey man, we need some help here. Our our soil, our soil is awful. We can't grow anything. Um, and well, I guess to give you a little bit of background behind Rudolf Steiner, he was an esotericist. He could see into other worlds, and he could, um, just like just like I'm talking to you right now, he could he could look into other worlds and pull information. And it sounds strange, but. Everything he's done is quite legit. I mean, the, the proof is just there, at least in the in the vegetables. But um, it works. It works on a, a star system. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's really bizarre trying to explain it. Really, it's just you, you you work with you work with the planets and the stars and the Earth, and nothing is left out. It's 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 like nothing is left out. Everything works together. So it's pretty much the harnessing of energies through. Whoops, sorry, my. No, you're all good. Up. You're all good. It's the harnessing of energies, uh, cosmic energies, um, energy, the Earth energies. It's pretty wild stuff, but um, yeah, I've, I've. We had the cherry tomato. We had the cherry tomato challenge. All right. My uncle, my uncle and his master gardener, L.A. Rothrain. L.A. Rothrain. Uh, they have. It's hilarious. They have a battle each year. Who's gonna Who's gonna grow the tallest one? And and they just they bicker back and forth about it. It's really funny, but it's all, it's all in good fun. But they've they've made cherry tomato plants that have. I mean, they've harvested thousands, like some two thousand cherry tomatoes off of one plant. Coming from one seed mm -hmm. is, I mean, it's it's something to be it's something to be you know looked at. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> What's going on here? I remember so. when you sent me um, those seeds, and it was yeah, it was really when I when I tried it for the first time, I couldn't believe. Number one, it's a cherry tomato, but it was so big. Like it was the yeah. biggest cherry tomato I've ever seen, and it tasted so good. I have, oh yeah, I have. Uh, this is a biodynamic cucumber. Okay. I mean, it's huge. It's huge. Whoa. And that's a squash of some sort. It'll stay. F this I had one of these in my cupboard last year for months, and it stays fresh for so long you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and how um have you has Uncle Bob been harvesting honey this year yet, or is he gonna wait till the fall? Um, I think he, I think he has already harvested some honey. Does he harvest uh, bee pollen as well? You know, he doesn't. He didn't. He does. He, he hasn't. He you hasn't. Look into he that. has. He has someone else help him out with that, okay. and I'm not even sure he's aware that he can get it. But I ha I have to get on him. I gotta get on about that because I think I'm missing out. We're oh missing. my gosh! I mean, you guys are in such a pristine, really unpolluted area. I would think. I mean, I don't think there's much industry up there. I, mean, I don't know. Are there any coal? Well, plants? There, there is. There's 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 Kendall. There's a, there's refineries around, mm -hmm. but um, as far as I mean, the, the bees are so happy in this area because he, they have everything they need right there. You know, they don't have to go too far away. Right, right. They have the best flowers they could ask for right in the area, so I don't, I don't know how far they stray. Probably not too far. To honest. But yeah, he's got a great setup there. He's got the chickens, he's got the bees, he's got, he's got cows on a different property, and yeah, he's got a really good setup. He's actually expanding. Oh, he's great. Expanding. You, you, I would love to get you two together. You guys would have a, probably have a great conversation. I would really like to come up there. What's the best way from to, from New York City to get up to Bradford, I, Pennsylvania? I would I would say just get on the train. You can just go right to Penn Station. That's the way I go. Get on Penn, go to Penn Station and take a train to Buffalo, 
and uh, I'll come, I'll come pick you up. <laughs> All right, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> be great. That'd be really nice, man. Um, have you noticed, as far as like with his eggs, like do they get oranger as the season progresses? Oh yeah, you, in the wintertime you definitely notice that they're pale. They're yeah. quite pale. And it's like, it's funny because you have like the Egglands, you know, like the Egglands best organic eggs or whatever. Yes. And like um, one day I had... Yeah, they're horrible. I had, um, I was at my parents' house and I was making some eggs, having a breakfast with my mom. And there was one Eggland one left and like three, you know, three of my uncles left. And I put the other Eggland in there, I cracked it in there. It was just so much more pale compl compared mm -hmm. to, the, to the, you know, the homegrown. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, it, even after, it's, um, I buy these ones in New York City and, and they're, they're probably $5 a dozen and they're supposed to be, it says like progressively pastured and everything. And they're still, they don't compare to like the Amish farmer or like even the young kid that has some, that has chickens and he's like really focusing on getting the grass into his chickens. And yeah. I, I just don't know how, how these big companies that are really promoting the pasture, the pasture raised eggs, they still just can't get that dark orange color in the yolks. I don't know. It's maybe it's too big of a production, probably. It's almost like they're lying, because yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, I know. I mean, even even if they're doing the practice, whatever, they're just not getting the results. They're yeah. not getting the results even close. Yeah. Yeah. But it's. I love what you have going on in Minnesota, man. With with. with I wish I had some chickens or something. Or some it's ducks. the way to go. It's the way to go. Yeah. You think at some point you might? Well, if you get, probably if you were there more more of the time, you might I, get some chickens. Yeah, the the trick would just be to get my parents into it. Like I, I got my dad into the bees, but the chickens are a little more work, obviously. And then mm -hmm. uh, I I, feel, I really feel like if they were to tap into it, they would see the benefits and they would just become pets. But they're still kind of uh, standoffish about getting chickens. It, it's. At some point, it might be interesting to just go ahead and do it and then let them deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Just get yeah, them. Yeah, apologize later because once, it's, once they're there and they start working with the, with the chickens, I think they'll come to love it, you know? Yeah. They really will. Now, does your uncle have them? Um, I know they're, I'm, I'm sure they're free range, but he, does he have them like in a paddock system where he moves it or yeah. are they just all over? He's, act he's, actually got a, he's actually got an electric fence around him uh -huh. because... It, the fo fox will come down oh, sure. in two seconds and just tear the whole place apart. So yeah, he's really got to keep that part guarded, and um, it seems to work. It mm -hmm. works. It's worked so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, and where, where does he? And he gets his manure from those cows on the other property, or um, not quite. He he just he has friends that have manure and he just goes and picks it up you know okay. and, yeah. and he lives in the township so he'll ask the township to drop off like leaves and you know when it's fall season he'll ask he'll say hey bring all the leaves that you pick up to my place nice. and when I was younger he would pay me to break the leaf bags open and spread the leaves out and mulch, mulch the garden yeah uh -huh. so uh -huh. it's pretty he's no dummy yeah, he knows. I mean, the results are there. With the, I've seen the photos. I mean, the place yeah. is going off. And he's 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 clearing out more space too. He's he's uh he's getting into the berry trees now. So he's starting to he's starting to get away into the more permanent things, cool. which is really smart. Which you talk about dealing with the fruit trees and the nut trees and not messing around with things you have to babysit and plant every year. And yeah, that's really smart. Yeah, it's really, uh, the, the whole forest gardening idea is really all about lazy people gardening. That's what it's called. It's like la the lazy person's guide to gardening is, is the food forest. Why mess around? I mean, it's great to have your square foot raised beds with your veg and, and your tomatoes, obviously. But overall, most of the system is pretty much based on perennials. So it just, it's a lot easier. You just harvest. Some occasional weeding, some mulching in the fall. But otherwise, it's just harvest. So it's not so serious. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of like growing stuff, have you... Um, ever inoculated mushrooms into logs? I haven't. I feel bad. Uh, Jake from rawutah.com raw sent me some, and I still haven't put them in. Yeah, yeah. I just I, have. I haven't gotten around to locating the the right type of logs, and where am I going to set it up at? Mm-hmm. You know? 
what stupid, not, stu- stupid excuses pretty much well yeah yeah <laughs> that's okay oh, do you know what like as far as rishi i know chaga really likes the birch mm-hmm. do you notice if rishi grows on certain trees elm 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 um hemlock i'm sorry hemlock hemlock at least the rishi suge was on the hemlocks just and, and that's and that's one of the parts about trying to find these Look for a hemlock forest. Look for like a, like um, a piney, a piney shaded forest with maybe a stream, and you're gonna want to look for um, fallen over trees, fallen over pine trees, pretty much. Oh, so well, uh, okay. so a hemlock pines. is a it's an evergreen. It's yeah. Well, it, it has pine needles. Okay. I believe, um, but. Uh, and they're usually growing on dead trees or living trees. But yeah, dead and dying trees, man. Okay. Dead and dying trees. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed so. the. Um, I have a lot of poplars on the property, and the uh, Fomus fomentarius, the Iceman fungus, just loves the poplar for some reason. Just yeah. all over, all over. And then I see like I have a lot of turkey tail growing on the birch, but I don't see. Yeah, that's a beautiful specimen. Beautiful. Wow, yeah. but I never see, I never really see any chaga, and I'm kind of, I, I think I'm a little bit further south than you on the, you know, on the, the, uh, the latitude longitude kind no, of thing. No, you're actually way north. Really, Alexandria. You're actually way north compared to me. Well, I'm kind of like in an oak maple basswood forest, and then I have to drive about an hour north to start seeing large amounts of birch trees. I've got some birch on the property, but really there's maybe like five birches instead of like a whole stand. And I, someone told me, I think it's like one out of every hundred trees or you, do you know the ratio that you might see chaga? I don't know the ratio, but it's, it's slim. It's pretty slim. Yeah. It's slim. And when you knock off the, the fruiting body, which is what we would consume, does um, the, my, the mycelium on the inside, will that continue to produce another fruiting body after? It will. It'll, it'll just keep going until the nutrients are gone. Uh-huh. Pretty mm-hmm. much. Wow. So it, it's, you know, you have to consider the state of the tree, you know, as far as if you're going to take the chaga or not. I, I like to... I like to take chug off of trees that look like they're at the end of the rope and like they're almost done. Or if the tree looks like it's about done and it looks like a decent size, and I'll take that. One. But I'm not gonna take I'm not gonna take you know small bits of a skinny tree that's mm-hmm. not grown yet. You know. Yeah. Um, have so, you noticed now like that people are getting more into the wild foraging that it's harder to find stuff in the woods or are you I mean I know you're kind of in an area where there's not a lot of health enthusiasts so maybe it's easier to find stuff but I've heard like in Maine where everyone's into this stuff people are starting to have a kind of a hard time finding this really like you have to go deeper and deeper into the woods to find it yeah now. I can imagine I can I have there's no there's no shortage yeah. I mean it's. I mean, you don't exa- you don't exactly walk into the woods and like, oh, there's every mushroom I wanted to find right there. I, mm-hmm. I mean, you have to search, mm-hmm. regardless. But I don't. I don't notice anything being picked over. But that's yeah. why. That's kind of a good thing, you know. Like it's cool that people are so aware up there. And but as but as far as everywhere else, nobody. Right. Hey, buddy. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, nobody else wants this stuff, so there's just a ton there. For that. I mean, and there's no shortage. There's always going to be mushrooms. Right. So that's kind of I, – I really want to teach people how to get into the woods and find this stuff for themselves. Yeah, yeah. I know it's, it's really nice with Keystone Herbs is that you're, you're both educating and then you're offering the product for those that are too busy um, to get yeah. it themselves. I think that's the key. Yeah, it, it's it's about bringing the mushrooms back, man. It yeah. really is. Because who's, I mean, really, if you look around in our population, who is consuming medicinal mushrooms? One out of 10,000 people? One out of even 100,000 people? I don't know. Yeah. 50,000? Yeah. And the Asians, the Asians know what's, they know what's going on. They yeah. know what's good. And yeah. they're all over the mushrooms. Yeah. It's been a part of their culture forever, and they haven't let it go. Mm-hmm. It's just funny that since 
and, and it was a part of all our culture too, where, where we came from. But when we came over to this new land, it seems like things got reset, and yeah. things did not everything made it. Yeah, yeah, it definitely did, and it's like it's a resurgence now, where everyone's like remembering the ancient ways. Yes. Wow, so cool. One question about the chaga. Like, you say the rishi can go bad if it's left on the log too long. Like, the bugs can get to it. But can ch chaga is just a perennial grower. It doesn't really go bad, right? Yeah, it, it doesn't go. I mean, I mean, if um, it actually will go bad if it's if it stays on the tree long after it's done. Mm -hmm. Taking all the nutrients for the tree. Mm -hmm. Bugs. I, I've seen. I've seen ch some chaga that's just like really, really old. Yeah, and doesn't look good. Like I wouldn't take it home. I wouldn't use it. And I got to leave it there. Okay. But um, other than that, no. It just it just grows and grows and grows yeah. until until there's nothing left to take. And then I heard most of the anti-cancer properties in chaga is the black exterior. But if you, or I remember Vitalis doing a video about that, and if he said if you're if you're healthy and you just want an everyday tonic to take off the black and save it for later, and then just use the 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 brown core on the inside. Any right. any um, comments on that? Um, yeah, the the black part is actually the medicinal part that if you have too much of it, it could harm you. Okay, uh, but um, he's had it every day for years and years with the black part mm -hmm. and some of some friends of mine and they've, they've never noticed anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anything bad happened. but it's yeah the black the black mass is concentrated with betulinic acid ah uh, yes and betulinic or bet betu betulin betulin betulinic so yeah betulinic acid okay or it could be say betulinic acid but um that's what concentrates really richly on on the black the black parts. So yeah. yeah, he just shaves that. I have I don't always shave it off could because sometimes sometimes I'll just use an inside piece like this and there won't even be a black part around it. So mm -hmm. it's not often it's not often that I even get that much black mass in my tea. But I, it's it's something to be aware of. Either way, I'm I'm not afraid of it though. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Before we go, give us a, a quick recipe, like a chaga rishi, something that like someone would want to make as a tea uh, that they could maybe you know I don't know like some vanilla or some cream, something that a newbie would really appreciate. If they're gonna get some chunks from you, what would they do to make it to really soup it up? Mm, well, you take you take the chaga. Oh, well, here's the chug. But I have, I also have shilajit. Nice. Which is really awesome. This is one of the th like, when I buy supplements, I don't always have an immediate. I don't always notice immediately the effects. But if you have like too much shilajit, or like if it's your first time, I guess you're supposed to like, kind of like prime yourself, have a little bit, a little bit more, and build upon it. Maybe like half a like quarter of a tablespoon the first time, and then maybe a half tablespoon build up. But it just it ramps you up. This mm -hmm. stuff ramps you up. I mean, you have energy. You feel you feel something going on in your brain. Like this is good stuff. Yeah. It, it it's it improves the efficacy of nutrients that are mixed with it. So it's thought that this mixed with you know the mushrooms. It can, it can improve its nutrients. Cool. Mushrooms. So I like to take a chaga, a, a chaga base, um, maybe a half a tablespoon of shilajit. Right. Tablespoon of cacao. And okay. then some honey. And that's a really, really awesome drink. Cool. That's that sounds really great. Drink. That sounds amazing. It really is. But you can't put too much, you can't put too much shilajit in there because it's kind of smoky has a, has a different taste. Yeah, you're gonna throw it off too much if you put too much shilajit. But yeah, oh, that sounds um, awesome. It's it's a great drink. Cool. And but there'll, there'll be more tutorials. I'll have drink tutorials on um, the website on keystoneherbs.com to help everyone out and give them some ideas and some inspiration. Great, great. And how else can people find you online? Um, you can go to facebook.com forward slash 
Kurt Cummins, C U R T C U M M I N S. Okay. I'll add you there, and you can go to keystoneherbs.com and sign up on the mailing list. And I want to keep people informed with. I, I love to take pictures in the woods. I love to take. I like to document my, you know, my foragings, and I want to share that with everyone. Awesome, awesome, man! It's really a pleasure to have you on the show. I mean, a longtime friend, and uh, really, just you're really a really hero for me for what you're doing in the lifestyle. I really appreciate everything you're doing for the community. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, yeah. Really appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Take care. I hope to, I hope to be on again. Oh, you will, of course. All right. All right, brother. Really. All right, Thanks, take care, guys. buddy. Keystone Herbs, everyone. Peace, Kurt. Later, man. Thanks, Anthony. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. And uh, right here, Chaga, Rishi, amazing medicine from the forest, wild harvested by people who care. Thanks so much, Anthony Anderson, OnlyOneTV.com. Peace. Have a great week. See ya. Thank you.